Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, on behalf of uh, USGI, I would like to welcome you to uh, this seminar. My name is Yoshiaki Abe. I'm an operating advisor of USGI. USGI was established in April 2009 as an uh, NPO in Washington, D.C. Uh, and it was established by five competing universities in Japan. Competing universities. Um, and the purpose of this uh, organization is to increase the volume of our voice um, whether we are doing a good job or not anyway in Japan. And we would like to raise our voice in the United States on whatever we are doing in issues, um, policy issues, etc. in Washington, D.C. And today's issue is one of the issues that we would like to present to you. And as you remember, the comp you have to imagine what it means by computer. And, and now we are talking about security of computer use. So it's uh, the development, if you think, is quite quick. When I was a graduate student during the 1960s, I was one of the first users of uh, IBM's uh, mainframe, the first generation of IBM. And in order to run a program, it used to take more than eight hours to get the result. But now, everything can be done in front of you on the lab. Uh, and the age, uh, my age, age becomes uh, quite an obvious thing to even to define the issue of the problem. Let me introduce two speakers. The first one is, as you can see, uh, from Waseda. Professor uh, Kazawa and a strategy executive, IT executive, Mr. Lynch. Mm -hmm. So, would you like to start the presentation? Or? Professor Kazawa, yeah. let's welcome him. Thank you, Mr. So, I'm sorry. Uh, Abe Sensei and I have the same gym name, Yoshiaki, but we have a different Chinese characters. So, today I'd like to talk about uh, cyber security, cyber security on cloud computer computing systems. So, um, the senior executive, executive director for research promotion at the IP promotion of Waseda University. So today my talk is uh, my talk concerns the cloud computing systems and cyber security from the user point of view. So Five or six years ago, I did not like the word cloud computing because cloud computing, the word cloud computing is an undefined term. Nevertheless, all difficult software problems can be easily solved by cloud computing. Cloud com also, cloud computing is realized at very low cost. Unbelievable for me. It must be only a buzzword. But now, it is getting to be clear. This shows the essential characteristics of cloud computing. A, co a consumer can provision computing capabilities such as server time and network storage as needed 
automatically without requiring human interaction. with each service provider. So these capabilities are available over the network and access through standard mechanisms that promote use by heterogeneous team or tip client platforms such as PCs, mobile phones, and smartphones. So the provider's uh, computing resources are pooled to serve multiple consumers using a multi-tenant model with different physical and virtual resources dynamically assigned or and reassigned according to consumer's demand. This is this is a sense of location independence in that the customer generally has no control or knowledge over the exact location of the provided resources. So these capabilities can be elastically provisioned and released in some cases automatically to the consumer the case capabilities available for provisioning over uh, often appears to be unlimited and can be ap appropriated in any quantity at any time. So the cloud system automatically control and optimize resource, resource use by leveraging a metering capability. Resource usage, usage can be monitored, controlled, and reported, providing transparency both the provider and consumer of the utilized service. So now, Cloud computing system can be classified as follows. From service models and the other is another is deployment models. So software as a service for SaaS, the capability provided to the consumer is to use the provided applications running on the cloud infrastructure. The applications are accessible from various client devices through either a thin client interface, such as a web or a program interface. Next is a platform as a service called the PaaS. The capability provided to the consumer is to deploy onto the cloud infra infrastructure using programming languages, libraries, services, and tools supported by the provider. The last one is infrastructure as a service, called IRS. The capability provided to the consumer is to provision, <coughs> pro uh, processing, storage, networks, and other fundamental computing resources where the consumer is able to deploy and run arbitrary software, which can include operating systems and applications. Another axis is based on deployment models. First one is a private cloud. In this private cloud, the cloud infrastructure is provisioned 
for exclusive use by a single organization. It may be owned, managed, and operated by the, the organization or a third party or some combination of them. And it may exist on or off promises. Se uh, second one is community cloud. The cloud infrastructure is provisioned for exclusive use by a specific community of consumers from organizations that have shared concerns. <coughs> it may be owned, managed, operated by one or more of the organizations in the community. The third one is public cloud. The cloud infra, uh, in public cloud, the infrastructure is provisioned for open use by the general, uh, general public. It may be owned, managed, and operated by a business, academic, or a government organization, or a combi uh, some combination of them. It exists on the premises of the cloud provider. And the last one is hybrid cloud. In hybrid cloud, the infrastructure is a composition of two or more distinct cloud infrastructures, such as private cloud, community cloud, or public cloud, that remain unique entities. So, now, this is uh, our schedule for cloud computing in Russell University. Now, we have more than 200 servers and maintain. So in a few years, all current servers is transformed to cloud servers. We estimate the number of cloud servers is under 15, uh, 50. So this is an example of our cloud systems. This is before cloud. This example is CMS content management system of Western University named course nine. So all hardware resources are maintained in Western University and all students and faculties and so on access these hardware via internet. Now, after cloud, these <coughs> hardware resources are kept in some way in the uh, in Tokyo area and students or uh, faculties are access via internet. So we take, we have took about two months from here to here. It is only a short time. Oops. So, but some problem in cloud computing. One is reliability uh, problems, security problems, legal problems, and uh, service provider problems, and so on. Now, security problems is the most uh, severe problems, I think. So, the, the Washington Post newspaper yesterday, I have Yeah. Google 
to track users across all its site. Company decisions not to let people opt out raise privacy concerns. So this means Google soon Google will, will soon know far more about who you are and what you do on the, the web. So I think it is a serious problem. So such a uh, crowd problem will become more and more important. So, but these problems are solved by powerful uh, crowd suppliers such as IBM. Now, next, so Linto san speak how to attack the uh, crowd problems in IBM. Okay, thank you. Jeb Linton. I'm with IBM Corporate Strategy uh, from uh, IBM headquarters, and uh, I'm a specialist in cloud computing, architectures, and security. And uh, again, thank you for having me here today. I'll apologize, my voice is a little bit uh, coarse, uh, but uh, hopefully we'll be okay through this presentation. I'm going to go rather quickly uh, through these slides. There's more technical detail here than I, I think we want to go into, but I'll look forward to any, uh, any level of technical questions uh, afterwards. So, cloud computing, as, uh, as you've heard, it is uh, an emerging paradigm in computing. And each time a new method of general computing comes along, the main inhibitor to adoption of it is security. Uh, we see this in cloud computing. It is the number one inhibitor uh, to adoption of cloud computing. We can even see this in other areas, such as mobile computing, the, the number one inhibitor to adoption of mobile computing in the enterprise is also security. So this is a very common theme that we've seen many times over the years. And we find that security evolves uh, to meet each of these, uh, these challenges as a new paradigm emerges every few years. The same is true of cloud computing. So what it comes down to with cloud computing is that, as you've heard, when you, when you uh, have an infrastructure that is shared among many people, many users, many different workloads, it has new security challenges. For example, uh, you have to have systems capable of maintaining identities and access control for many different users and potentially many different separate organizations. So the level of complexity of identity and access control is magnified. Likewise, uh, when you have to segregate the, the infrastructure and separate data and information that is uh, potentially sensitive, and belonging to potentially many different organizations, again, the, the need for isolation technologies is magnified over the traditional uh, IT infrastructures. The ability to segregate not just your computing resources, but your storage resources, your networking resources, and the ability, for example, to federate identity and access control systems, which essentially means uh, having a central system for the cloud that is capable of connecting to many separate systems uh, becomes considerably more important and it adds levels of complexity beyond what we've traditionally had in most information technology architectures. 
governance, risk, and compliance is, of course, uh, complex enough as it is. But when you have a, a, an infrastructure such as a cloud that needs to support many different types of workloads, some of which might have to be compliant with uh, a regulatory regime such as that, is, that which is required for medical data, and also at the same time support workloads uh, that may have government data or financial data, the complexity of the governance uh, can become quite complex. There is also the dimension of public versus private cloud. Uh, we, uh, let's see. <laughs> we've, uh, we've got a, a spectrum, uh, and of course, uh, private cloud will also include community cloud, as, as you've heard. Um, the, the concerns for security vary depending on the type of cloud that you're talking about. So, for example, in a private cloud or a community cloud where the infrastructure is entirely controlled within one organization, there's a much greater ability to specialize the security controls having to do with that particular cloud. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, if you have a, a fully public cloud that must serve many, many different people and organizations, there's much less ability to specialize and customize the security controls. However, in general, the same rules apply. It, generally, you have the same range of security controls that need to be considered. Now, uh, I don't want to, to make an advertisement for IBM. I'll just say that all businesses that are, in, that are doing cloud work uh, these days generally have evolved from businesses that have uh, been doing things like outsourcing. Uh, strategic outsourcing is a big business for us, as with several of our competitors. We have evolved the, the security practice uh, over the course of years, and that feeds directly into cloud security. It's simply a natural evolution for most of us that are in this business. The key to it is building in security at every layer of the cloud infrastructure. And without going into too much detail, I'll simply say that whether you're talking about an infrastructure as a service, where your main concerns are things like how to secure virtual machines, the virtual servers, uh, how to secure uh, your hypervisor, which is the underlying layer of software on which the virtual servers reside, or whether you are talking about a platform as a service or software as a service offering, where your concerns are more uh, securing your application against application level attacks and uh, building in robust identity and access control systems, the same essential concerns apply. And you simply have to uh, customize them depending on the type of cloud uh, that you're, you're building. You'll, you'll notice that my uh, talk is more from the perspective of uh, business trying to build a cloud or potentially trying to procure the services of a, from a cloud uh, than from the individual user. Uh, but you uh, can certainly ask, answer questions from whatever perspective you like. I won't go into the details of this because the framework for security varies depending on the company. But each cloud provider or a cloud, uh, well, let's say, uh, operator will typically have a security framework a foundational set of security controls which applied for the most part even in traditional IT infrastructures uh, but now they need to be reapplied and applied in a, essentially a custom way depending on the particular needs of uh, the cloud implementation. This has to take place throughout the life cycle of the implementation. During the design phase it is critically important to build with security in mind. One of the most difficult uh, problems that we've seen with clients trying to adopt cloud methodologies is building systems that were not designed for security from the beginning. Uh, there's often a mistake, uh, mistake, mistaken assumption that because the cloud provider uh, has designed a, a, a good secure cloud, that it's no longer as important to build in security onto the applications that will be de deployed onto that cloud. It is a mistake. The right way to approach it is to take the, the assumption that 
the underlying cloud is not going to provide the security for the overlying applications. Security has to be built in, not just into the, the cloud on which you run, but also into the applications that you put onto the cloud. So design it from the very beginning with security in mind, whether you're going to be using your own cloud or someone else's cloud. During the deployment phase, it's important to, uh, to take into account uh, good security practices and uh, to, to build in uh, the assumption that not just in deployment, but also throughout the life cycle of your application or implementation, that you will be uh, adhering to whatever compliance regime that your particular workload is designed for, whether it be a simple uh, uh, compliance regime within an enterprise for basic, uh, basic uh, safety uh, precautions, or a much more elaborate one such as those that are required for sensitive health care data or financial data. Build it with this in mind from the beginning with the plan to maintain that throughout the life cycle of the application. Now, to take a few particular examples, the type of cloud that you're going to be implementing, will, uh, they, they have to be considered for all levels of security, but there will be particular uh, areas of focus depending on the, the type. For example, when building an infrastructure as a service cloud offering, it's most important to, uh, to be concerned with the infrastructure level. As I mentioned before, the, uh, the servers, the, the physical infrastructure, the hypervisor software that runs directly on the server uh, in so-called bare metal, uh, and the, the ability to partition the infrastructure up in order to separate one workload from another so that if a, uh, a, a rogue operator on one workload tries to escape and get access to other people's data, that that's effectively impossible, made impossible by the way that the infrastructure itself works. If building a platform as a service offering, there is a, more, there is a greater focus on data and application information segregation. Uh, and, uh, and then, for example, the cloud service provider is uh, much more concerned with governance and compliance. They need to know that uh, the infrastructure is capable of supporting particular workloads such as regulated healthcare or regulated financial data. Uh, and then finally, software as a service, the, the focus is on application level security, building in your applications in such a way that they aren't susceptible to things like uh, SQL injection attacks, if you're familiar with that. But essentially, building a secure application without simply assuming that the underlying cloud will give you the security you need. Uh, I'll hit on this just very briefly. The main message that I wanted to uh, touch on here is that regardless of what security framework you have, all elements of security have to be considered for every implementation of cloud and one size does not fit all. Just because uh, a set of security controls work for one implementation of cloud, that is not, doesn't make it a safe assumption that that same set of security controls will apply to the next implementation. Uh, very briefly, I'll just uh, touch on a, a, a couple of examples here. This is an example of a private cloud uh, enabling your data center for cloud. The most important uh, elements to think about in this case are the user identity uh, and control system, which is typically managed by what we call a service automation manager. Typically, uh, the, uh, the, the process uh, that you'll see in, act in operation is that uh, the user logs into uh, the service automation system, is designated to be uh, given resources, resources from a particular security domain, particular to that user. And within that security domain is delegated, uh, pardon me, is designated the appropriate security policy. And then uh, essentially that policy uh, is applied as the resources are provisioned to that user. Uh, likewise, uh, any appropriate updates or patches are applied when the resources are given to that user. So that's relatively simple. Things get a little bit more complex when you look at the cloud service provider model. Typically, in a model like this, both the uh, individual users and machines accessing resources in the cloud 
have to attach over encrypted and authenticated uh, connection methods over the network. Most of the time, these services are internet facing, and so you'll be using a virtual private network or other encrypted connection to connect. Uh, inside uh, the perimeter, uh, the operation is largely the same as with a private cloud. Essentially, you have to go through a uh, more rigorous set of perimeter controls, such as firewalls, uh, and very likely intrusion detection and prevention systems, other sophisticated security controls. Uh, but once inside, the allocation of resources largely proceeds the same way. One critical element of this, however, is that in public uh, computing uh, clouds, you typically have to have a, a continuous security monitoring and vulnerability assessment process going on all the time. We think of the controls as a, a level of a, sort of a hierarchy of sophistication. The basic controls that, uh, that are needed are typical IT controls such as firewalls and access control systems. With cloud computing, you really need to have a, a more proficient level of security such as building in inherent security controls to every level of the system and have those, having those security controls integrated with uh, your, your regular business operations. Finally, uh, and this is touching on the, the message that I'd like to leave you with on the last slide, a, a final optimized level of security leading to what we call security intelligence is emerging as the new paradigm for security, not just in clouds, but really in information technology in general. And uh, the, the basic message is that because so many uh, different security controls are needed. There's, there's just a, a vast number of security controls required within cloud computing and technology, information technology in general. We've gotten to the point where it's most efficient to actually build what's known as a security analytics system, a central overarching system that collects the information from all of the different security controls and correlates events in order to, uh, to uh, send an alert when something suspicious is happening. For example, uh, if uh, the incoming firewall or virtual private networking system detects that someone is accessing the system from an unusual block of addresses, perhaps in an unusual part of the world for that particular workload, and subsequently there are several failed password attempts, and subsequent to that uh, there is perhaps a large number of uh, virtual machines turned up that generate uh, a lot of strange, in strange network traffic. One of these new security analytics systems can correlate all of these events and point out that this is not consistent with the typical behavior of the system as it has been characterized over time. Therefore, it is probably an anomalous event, probably a security event that a human needs to take a look at. So this is the emerging paradigm of security analytics, especially as it applies to cloud computing. And uh, frankly, that's the, the main message that I wanted to leave you with. There are a number of other advanced technologies that we are working on, such as building in greater security controls into the processor itself. Uh, this is uh, another emerging trend. There are uh, a number of other similar emerging trends like that uh, that are largely in research at this point. Uh, but anyway, I'd like to thank you all for your time, and I look forward to your questions. My question is about the statistics, the current scene, uh, how much used. Uh, so, uh, to, in total, how big, I don't know, what's the rate of that? 
how heavy the usage of computing and the share from private hybrid, hybrid, and so forth. And uh, it's possible to uh, share between large companies like multinational versus small medium enterprises. Well, I'm afraid I don't have any exact figures for you. Um, but I can say that, uh, let me see if I can remember. Um, the, the great majority of cloud computing is taking place in enterprises that are gradually migrating their existing legacy workloads and building new workloads into private clouds. Most of the, uh, and I think that the last I saw of that was, I think it was uh, as of last year in the neighborhood of 25% uh, of, the, of their workloads, but growing very rapidly. Um, and uh, on the public computing side, most of the most of the workloads that we've seen there uh, are split between uh, people who are building brand new companies around new uh, uh, new types of security model that were what we call born on the cloud, uh, things that were designed from the very beginning to be on a public cloud. Uh, there are, there are a large number of uh, prominent recent internet startups that operate in that way. Uh, and uh, the other uh, dominant uh, behavior on those clouds is uh, those doing development and testing that uh, are likely to deploy the workload either in a private cloud or as a private enterprise application, but simply want to take advantage of the, uh, the uh, fact, as Fukuzawa would say, described, that they can get these resources uh, in an elastic form and they don't have to invest a lot of money. So I don't know um, what, the, uh, what the numbers are, unfortunately, uh, regarding the, the percentage of, uh, of uh, traffic or percentage of workloads that are, uh, that are on the public cloud. Is that what you said? Yeah, I don't know too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not a professional officer. <laughs> uh, my question is that I have this uh, uh, cloud computing system, of course, is very much dependent on the internet. Uh, so there must be some uh, uh, correspondence between the, uh, the internet uh, protocol and the uh, cloud computing protocol. Uh, I'm clear about this. Uh, you have this uh, three levels uh, application and uh, platform and uh, infrastructure. Uh, the, the, each uh, sort of uh, level corresponds to the, the uh, internet protocol separately, or it's not that uh, simple? Or, uh, it's largely yeah, How do you define this uh, cloud? I'm not. Well, obviously, it's, uh, it's, it's not uh, just a physical uh, sort of uh, system. That's my uh, first question. The second question is also what. Uh, uh, you showed this uh, uh, Washington Post uh, article. Uh, I wasn't clear about it. Uh, if you compare the uh, security of cloud computer system with the uh, non-cloud computing system, are you saying that uh, you, you can solve the, uh, some of the security issues by going to cloud computing system? Or do you um, on the first uh, question, the uh, the protocol that's used is mostly dependent on, uh, it, let's say it's less dependent on whether you're talking about infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, as it is on whether it's a private cloud or a public cloud. By and large, all of the services operate over the internet protocol, but uh, Private cloud services are typically done within the private network of a particular uh, company and, and therefore can just use the, the standard protocols on top of internet protocol uh, of each of the applications on the cloud. Now, if you're doing a, a public cloud, you will still have those same protocols in operation. Let's say, for example, uh, HTTP, if it's a web-based application, will still be perhaps the, the dominant protocol, but if it's running over a public cloud, 
it's, uh, it's much more likely in many cases to be also operating over an encrypting protocol, such as uh, a virtual private network uh, or, or other encrypted connection, depending on whether you're talking about a, a private web-based application on a public cloud or a, uh, just an, an open uh, web application. By and large, the protocol is determined by the particular application more than the type of cloud infrastructure. Yes. The second question. Yeah. This is a uh, yesterday's news. So the important issue of this news is um, Google gather um, more and more private data in Google's uh, resource pool. So if um, the resource pool is attacked by someone and so it causes a severe um, situations. So that means I, uh, it is doubtful for me if the strategy is good or no, I think. Introducing a cloud computing system, yeah. and uh, you can uh, reuse the uh, uh, servers, yeah. and that is um, maybe the one of the biggest uh, benefits yeah. to introduce a uh, cloud computing system. Yeah. But uh, according to this report, um, he told uh, that the, uh, it costs a lot to invest uh, uh, building up a uh, security system. Yeah. So the uh, Comparison with uh, uh, investment to building a uh, security system, which is, you know, yeah. rarely you can yeah. reduce cost. Yeah. Okay. We believe that uh, cloud computing systems are totally, uh, the cost of cloud computing systems are reduced by now, current cost. So, because hardware cost become very low uh, because becomes very low and plus uh, mm, mm, security cost totally so not so large I think uh, or I believe so I, I guess I would just add that uh, while it, it, there's a, a, a lot of complexity in building a system for cloud uh, to be very secure the overall cost is probably reduced because you're building in security across a very wide range uh, of workloads all running on the same infrastructure. And previously, to get the same level of security, you would have had to uh, have separate security efforts for each of the many workloads uh, to run on the same, um, well, to run on a previous system. So overall, uh, there is perhaps more investment up front uh, to make certain that you have uh, an infrastructure that's ready to host secure workloads, but the incremental effort of building the security into those workloads is greatly reduced. So the overall cost is probably reduced. Cloud computing infrastructure, 
one of the, the fundamental elements that you're, uh, that you're concentrating on is hardening the infrastructure against that sort of breach. So for example, uh, I'll just take the example of our uh, public cloud. Um, what, we, what we did with it is we, we took uh, our typical servers, uh, x86 servers from, from IBM, uh, with a, a hypervisor, in our case called KVM, based on Linux, and we hardened that hypervisor by modifying it, building updates to it, uh, contributing security updates to the open source community for everyone to use in this hypervisor in order to prevent one user on uh, a, one of these servers from being able to get access to resources of another user or to disrupt uh, the use uh, by another user. So essentially um, we're, we're building in controls native to the system that isolate each workload very strongly uh, to prevent uh, a misbehavior or a mistake of one user from affecting other users. And, and that is something that all, all of the major cloud computing providers, uh, they have to do that, build that in. Yes. <coughs> uh, I am a user of the Gmail system. So, so so Gmail is a typical public cloud system. So now I try to uh, make secure of Gmail system um, from my uh, computer. Maybe I can't uh, disturb, uh, I can't um, break the securities of the Google's uh, Gmail system. So uh, we are now I should also add, um, there have been some, some breaches of security on clouds, uh, but most of, the, most of the very visible breaches of security within clouds are actually about uh, people putting a workload on the cloud and just using that as, uh, as a, a jumping off point to, to do attacks outside the cloud. So for example, um, in some of the, the recently uh, publicized security breaches, uh, uh, hackers would put virtual machines onto a public cloud and, they, and then they would use those virtual machines for a distributed uh, denial of service attack or other attack outside the cloud rather than trying to attack the cloud itself. Most of the time, in fact, I'm not aware of any uh, instances of, uh, of someone on the cloud being able to breach the integrity of that cloud itself uh, in order to get access to other people's private information or <coughs> stop other people from using the cloud. It's usually uh, simply used as a tool uh, for, uh, for other purposes, other, uh, other types of attack. My name is Nakoto Yamamoto from Chuzu Electric Power Company, uh, one of the utility companies in Japan. Uh, I know that, that many, uh, many utility companies in this country are getting harder uh, about a uh, smart meter. Uh, as the penetration going on, uh, they have a lot of metadata, and uh, probably they are using it, already using this type of uh, technology. But uh, uh, do you think it's uh, uh, easy to have a higher security and uh, uh, easy to treat a huge amount of the data. And uh, uh, if uh, I have a two question, uh, is it easy way to have a uh, have a large amount of the data? And if, this is one point. And two point is uh, if you do not. Uh, uh, satisfied with the uh, service provider of uh, cloud computing. Uh, you can, I, I don't know uh, whether you can change into different uh, service provider easily or not. Well, let's see, on the, uh, the, the first question, we are very much uh, aware of the, the challenges of uh, utility providers and, and their uh, the problems that we call the big data problem. 
Um, big data is a, a buzzword that's been around a lot of lately, uh, dealing with problems like that. There's also the problem that uh, attackers have become much more sophisticated in the last few years, and we've seen the emergence of attacks like the Stuxnet worm against uh, sensitive utility infrastructures. I would not, to, to answer your question, I would not say that it is easy uh, to make these infrastructures secure, but I would say that any competent and rigorous security practice is capable of securing uh, infrastructures like that. The, the most vulnerable elements right now are not the cloud uh, where, you, uh, where these things operate, but the specialized utility infrastructure such as uh, microprocessors um, uh, that, uh, that are actually embedded in devices in the field. That's the, uh, the area that has been prominently attacked rather recently and it's causing a bit of a scramble among utility providers uh, to, to secure that. It, the technology is there, it's simply a matter of being very rigorous in its application. On the second, um, do you want to address the second? Yeah. Uh, okay, well, I'll just say um, the ability to move from one cloud provider to another is something that was rather difficult in the first few years, but as the standards have developed, it has gotten easier. It's not, uh, it's not as easy as um, uh, simply moving a, a virtual machine from one cloud to another. Typically, there is typically some work involved, but most of the cloud providers, all of the reputable ones, including us, of course, uh, will provide you with tools to allow you to move workloads, to, to help you work, move workloads around from one cloud to another. It's become the norm that uh, people will have their, uh, their workloads split between at least two infrastructures, either private and public, or a public cloud and another public cloud. Yeah. Second problem is, is a severe problem for me. Now, uh, to um, further develop, our cloud system is based on MEC, uh, so now we are selecting uh, uh, next cloud systems. So IBM, G2, Touch, and, and LEC. So uh, I believe the um, each cloud vendors have the migration systems for next systems. So I can answer your second question in maybe next year. <laughs> Particularly in an international environment, what are the legal obligations of the cloud provider to the owners of the information? I mean, there's precedent to treat information as an item of value. Uh, there's prosecutions for theft of information and felonious values of information even. Is it an embezzlement for a cloud provider to take information from a private user of the cloud? <laughs> there are a lot of challenges with building clouds uh, to serve international users. Uh, and and the, the, the legal challenge varies from region to region and country to country. Each country has different rules about the handling of data. So for example, um, uh, even within the, the European Union, there are quite different rules about data handling in Germany versus in most of the other countries in the EU. Uh, and when we build clouds into each of these areas, we have, we have to have local legal teams actually setting the, the specific requirements for that area. Likewise, when you're trying to enable clouds in each of those areas to handle different workloads, such as uh, in the United States we have uh, the HIPAA regulations for healthcare, uh, we have PCI regulations for, uh, for payment cards, uh, financial data, we have FISMA, we have, we have a, a whole stack of regulatory regimes that are specific to the United States and vary from one location to another. I'll say that most of what we do uh, is building in generic universal controls across all the clouds that keep data that prevent our systems 
from moving data from one Im instance of the cloud to any other instance of the cloud. So there's no, there's no leakage of data from one location to another caused by our system. If it does get moved, it has to be deliberately moved by the user of the cloud. And because the user has the ability to move data wherever they want to without our control, then the responsibility essentially falls on the user to be compliant with whatever regulatory regime they're trying to, to, to serve with their workload. Uh, there are also a number of other relatively generic universal controls, such as making encryption available uh, to the user. Encryption is a, a requirement common to many different regulatory regimes, but it's also something that's important to, to keep voluntary and up to the user because there are also some countries that forbid the use of encryption uh, by, uh, and for a number of reasons and a number of circumstances. So essentially, it's up to the international provider to provide the tool set and the basic security controls to prevent data from being moved or handled in any way other than the ways in which the user chooses deliberately to handle the data. <coughs> um, I'm Steve Winters, local researcher. Um, I'm sure you've thought about this, uh, but um, thinking of some of these large clouds, I mean, Google has been mentioned a couple of times. Uh, what's your biggest nightmare scenario? What would be the absolute <laughs> biggest disaster that could happen for one of these large data sets? How, how do you foresee it? That's a good question. Um, and it's, it's hard to answer because they're the security world is filled with all kinds of threats, and they, they change from year to year. But I would say that one of the most worrying threats is something that broadly is called zero-day attacks. Uh, this is uh, when a hacker, especially if, a, let's say, a, it's called a black hat hacker, a bad guy, uh, comes across a, a, an error, a bug in the fundamental code of one of the operating systems that is run on the cloud. Let's say, for example, uh, there's a, uh, a large cloud that, uh, that has a common set of software based on Linux on which all of the servers run and all the workloads on top of it are, to some extent, dependent on the integrity of that underlying software. If someone were to find, for the first time, an unpatched bug in the Linux operating system, let's say the core of the, of the Linux system on which all these clouds are based, and a way to actually exploit that from the outside, then in theory they could get in and compromise the entire cloud. Fortunately, these infrastructures are based on typically very mature code that's been uh, in the field for years and it's, it's very, very rare for not only a, a so-called zero-day attack, an unpatched uh, vulnerability to be found, uh, it's very rare for, it, for such a thing to exist and to be actually accessible from anywhere where a bad guy would be, on the outside on the internet or in a virtual machine on top of the cloud. Uh, typically, uh, they have to go through much more limited channels like uh, trying to, to uh, trick an administrator into giving them access, a so-called so social engineering attack. So while such things are theoretically possible, I think there's a very good reason why we haven't seen anything nightmarish like that yet. It's unlikely that it will happen. Right. Just to follow up on that, uh, since this is heating up again in some uh, discussions on the Cryptome site, uh, what about this long discussion for the last 12 years about a possible compromise in the IPsec stack of uh, OpenBSD? What's your standpoint on that? Because that's a perfect example of what you're just talking about. And it seems to be an unending debate. I don't know very much about that particular one. Do you have any insight? I don't know very much about that particular vulnerability, but it, from what Sorry, little alleged I Alleged vulnerability. Alleged, yeah. From what little I know, it sounds like it would be, as you just characterized it, one of these so-called zero-day attacks, a potentially un unpatched vulnerability. I'm afraid I don't know about that particular one, though. Okay. Um, this is just a generic question um, that I'm curious about. In the foreseeable future, I think the cloud is probably going to become more and more important as information is becoming more accessible with um, all these devices coming out, particularly like uh, Apple, like making accessing information a lot more readily, easily, from a basis. So what, do 
you foresee the next 10 years of the development of cloud and how that could affect the economy or our entire infrastructure? Great question. Would you like to do it? Okay. Well, I'll take a crack at it, but uh, it's always difficult to predict uh, more than a year or two out. I would say that uh, very broadly, we're seeing the rise and convergence of a number of trends that are all closely related, uh, or at least becoming closely related. Cloud computing is, of course, one of the big ones. And most of the new trends in information technology are going to be tightly linked with cloud. The other really big areas we've seen arising are mobile, so the movement of people's use of information technology from being dominantly on the desktop to a few years ago dominantly on the laptop. Now the, the, the dominant use of information technology is moving towards mobile devices. They, uh, practically every application uh, is uh, moving more in the direction of mobile. The second one is social. Uh, social networking has become a huge element of information technology and one that hasn't been quickly exploited by enterprise uh, users. But it's, uh, it, it's, in fact, even more dominant in the developing world than it is here in the United States. The use of things like Facebook and Twitter are moving from uh, a way of socializing with friends to a way of doing business and a way of conducting your life and your basic communications. So this is something that is already taking advantage of cloud computing, but it's going to become a much more prominent way of communication in, in general. A third one that I would say uh, is, is a, a major emerging trend is analytics. I touched on this a little while ago. This is uh, a means of bringing sophisticated software and sometimes hardware systems to bear on the big data problem that the, the other gentleman uh, brought up. The so-called big data problem is prevalent across many, many different realms. Uh, it, it, it's become very prevalent in utilities, uh, as we talked about. Telecommunications companies have more data than they know what to deal with. And the social networks, such as Twitter and Facebook, are dealing with an explosion of data. Analytics is the ability to use computer systems to call through and generate useful information out of a sea of largely unstructured, unannotated data. Uh, the amount of data that's out there that isn't in a database with rigid structure, but is instead in the form of documents and presentations and tweets and emails uh, that, that are not well labeled and, uh, and marked up for use, it has has grown to just completely inundate many enterprises and only with the application of very sophisticated uh, statistical and mathematical techniques, things like uh, some of you may have seen the Watson system that we built to, to answer Jeopardy questions, uh, the, a system that can actually interpret natural language uh, to, to, to find out what it's actually about. Uh, these are going to be, they're, they're already very much on the rise Cloud computing is the underlying enabling technology to allow analytics systems and vast social networks supporting mobile infrastructures to, to rise and become much more prominent parts of our everyday business and social lives. Uh, right. uh, about this uh, analytics, uh, dealing with uh, uh, I remember there was a uh, uh, effort uh, and it's called the semantic web, uh, transformed the entire sort of rather into the, the uh, sort of database system. Uh, to, to how you compare that report with this, uh, this uh, sort of cloud system? Would you like to handle that one? I'm afraid I don't know much about <laughs> the semantic web. I, I'm familiar with the term only vaguely, the, the semantic web. I'm afraid it's just a little bit before my time in this area, so I'm not sure I can comment very much. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, well, computing is a uh, real technique to use, but semantic web system is not a real technique, I think. So the um, um, cost to be uh, used for well, computing is uh, much larger than uh, the semantic web system and so on. So I think. Yeah. 
Um, thank you very much for the speech. Um, uh, my name is Cody Pita. I'm from the American University. Uh, I have one question. Like, so, as uh, so Mr. Lincoln mentioned, like, you know, many of the Facebook users, Twitter users, actually, I'm using this, so the Facebook and Twitter and mixing, which is a Japanese SMS. And, um, I, and then, like, that cloud systems, like, you know, have a bunch of information, as you said, or mentioned, and probably if it's got attacked, my like one of my may my information may like you know stolen be stolen by someone or something like that happen and uh, if the cloud you know sys computing system is like, developed and everybody use that probably the amount of the amount of information is got to be stolen like more than it used to be because it's like cloud you know, attack the one failure done everything so um, what we should like you know care for that I mean, like, you know it's this Think, yeah, you know, if you have the money, you just put in the you know shows or whatever, it's fine. But like you know, information is we can't like take care of that on the website. Or something. So, well, I would just say that um, there are a number of these uh, services that uh, are run on cloud technology, things like Twitter uh, and Facebook, and people have put a great deal of trust in those services and their security. Um, it, I'll be honest, it makes me nervous. I don't put my own personal private information on, on social networks yet. But I will say that knowing a bit about how they operate, they are trying to be very rigorous about the security. Uh, and they have done a great deal of work to, to prevent those kinds of breaches from happening. I can't speak for them to say whether their security is perfect. Security almost by definition is never perfect. Uh, but I would say that I think over the next decade or more, people are probably going to have to uh, be very, let's say, disciplined about where they put their personal private information. Uh, I know I am. I know most people in the security community are. Uh, and it, it, it worries us when we, uh, when we see you know, very young people putting lots of personal private information out there in public view. Um, it's going to have to evolve, and our society is already starting to, to evolve to handle that kind of uh, new mo means of communication. Uh, the security implications are a little frightening, but, uh, but the people that are building these services do typically try to be very cautious about how they build them. Yeah. I have the same uh, opinion as you. Yeah. That problem is a technical, it's not a technical problem, but a mental problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.